Okay, hi folks. Um, so on your screen you should have uh, Katy Perry and hopefully you've watched her video um, or some of it and you may be thinking it was amazing, it was fantastic. Uh, or some of you might be thinking mm, it's rather Freudian um, and you would be right. Uh, but what does that mean? Um, and today's lecture is going to be talking about uh, Sigmund Freud who is one of the key uh, figures of the 20th century. Uh, if you recall from last week's lecture we talked about um, um, that we're going to be looking at uh, Freud. We looked a little bit at, uh, at Newton and the impact of his theories um, and Darwin. Um, we won't be talking about Darwin anymore except I probably would just say that um, for people who don't believe in evolution, um, it's th that's just wrong. El evolution is um, um, pretty solid scientific fact. Um, I don't. I mean, most religious people um, who are well educated uh, have no problem with evolution. It's only uh, people lacking education. Um, so if you're pastor or minister or bishop or whatever tells you um, that evolution's wrong, you can send them to me. Um, who else did we talk about? Uh, we talked about, um, oh, Marx, um, and we'll be discussing Marx a bit more next week uh, as another one of the key thinkers of the 20th century, or influencing the 20th century. So here's Freud, uh, born right in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, there he is, and oh, 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 yep, um, that's multimedia. I, I go to great lengths. Um, so, uh, like a number of people at this time, he believed in science. Uh, he was looking at what's called a mechanistic worldview, so the world as some kind of machine. Isaac Newton had discovered the laws of physics, uh, the mechanics of how the universe worked. Um, Freud was interested in the mechanics of the mind. He was influenced by Darwin, who saw man as an animal with instinctive drives. Um, and he asked, how do these work with humans? So what's the background of Freud's work? Because none of these great theories and themes emerged out of nowhere. Um, they always have some kind of historical precedence. And for Freud, uh, a strange one, um, but interesting is the idea of magnetism. And magnetism was a popular scientific practice, um, uh, sort of early uh, Freud's life, um, and people were fascinated by this. This what this thing was. It was sort of magical, um, strange attraction between minerals, between planets, between people and the Earth. They, well, they weren't quite sure what what. Um, it consisted of. But in the 16th century, um, somebody called Paracelsus, who was a physician, an astrologer, an alchemist, he had, uh, had people claiming to be healed after he passed magnets over their body. Um, then in the 1700s, Father Maximilian Hell, and we shouldn't make fun of his name, Maximilian Hell, um, he can't help it, um, he was uh, fascinated by naked bodies, um, as many of us are. Um, and what he found was that he could heal people by pressing magnetic plates to the naked body. Um, and so this this kind of fell between the sort of realms of magic and and science. Some people thought that it was there was some kind of scientific evidence here, and others thought that it was just a load of uh, waffle. One of his students was somebody called Franz Mesmer. And Mesmer, um, Mesmer believed in animal magnetism. And we talk about animal magnetism today, um, you know, we're talking about an attraction between people, but um, at that time they thought that there was a magnetic fluid in living beings. Um, just to situate this uh, historically, so this was happening in 1770, um, at around about the same time that Captain Cook uh, discovered Australia in 1769. He had already discovered New Zealand, which was probably very, very exciting for the people that lived there to finally um, find that they were 
discovered. So mesmerism. Um, mesmer, and there's a film uh, about this. Uh, you can you can look it up online. Um, I think Alan Rickman plays uh, Franz Mesmer, um, but he would uh, have rods inserted into the earth, which patients had to take hold of, and then with the laying on of hands, he would cure his patients of mental and physical problems. The interesting thing was it clearly worked as a cure, but. Um, when people tried to find this magnetic fluid, it just didn't seem to be there, and it was finally discredited as a theory. But the practice of mesmerizing people um, was continued in dis different forms. And one of them, in England in the 1800s, um, took the term hypnosis. So mesmerism became hypnosis. Um, and James Braid showed how a patient could be put into a hypnotic trance through focusing the attention on a bright object. Um, and he wrote the first book on hypnotism in 1843. Um, Darwin's Origin of the Species had come out in 1859, so just a little bit after that. And Braid's theory didn't work all that well. It was trying to cure physical problems, but Jean-Martin Charcot used this on patients with a condition called hysteria. Um, and that's what our picture is there. This is Charcot, um, who was a neurologist demonstrating hypnotism on a hysterical patient. Um, hysteria today, when we, when we talk about the term, is uh, uncontrollable laughter or panic. But in the 1800s, it was this kind of um, term for a whole set of conditions among certain patients that seemed to be largely inexplicable. These patients were almost exclusively women, and it could be anything from panic attacks to complete mental breakdown. And because it was uh, a woman's problem, it was thought to be caused by problems in the uterus, and the uterus in Greek is hystera. Uh, and so we get the term hysteria. Um, and many people were locked up in asylums. Um, you know, maybe for years or for the rest of their lives with all sorts of experiments carried out on them um, because of these strange uh, problems that today, of course, um, we would never uh, sort of even think of them as problems, a lot of them. Um, Charcot, in fact, didn't believe it was only a woman's problem. Um, but uh, paintings like this one um, meant that he copped quite a lot of uh, criticism um, because of this, you know, uh, today. But Charcot did make hypnotism a legitimate technique. Um, and along, along into this in 1856, uh, in what's now the Czech Republic, uh, came Sigmund Freud. Um, at 17 years of age, uh, he went to the University of Vienna to study medicine. And in first year, he was taught by Ernst von Bruck. And for von Bruck, um, he saw the body as a machine, uh, and so that that means that it's basically a, a system of chemistry and physics kind of um, uh, equations, um, and that somehow we would be able to discover uh, how the body worked if we could just see it uh, in terms of being a machine. Freud also studied under Charcot in 1885. Um, and although he learned this uh, idea of hypnosis at that time, uh, a few years later he abandoned hypnosis for what he called uh, the talking cure. So like Charcot, Freud began in neurology, um, uh, and there was not such a distinction uh, at that time between neurology and psychiatry. Neurology is when you start cutting into the brain and seeing what, what the physical things are in there, and psychiatry is when you're doing the, the sort of talking cure, what Freud calls the talking cure. Um, he worked on patients with cerebral palsy with um, some success, and he started, using, uh, started off using hypnosis. Um, he also liked a bit of uh, cocaine, um, but of course, uh, at that time, um, you could sell cocaine uh, up until about 1914 without a license, and it was kind of um, taken by quite a few people. Um, he took quite a bit. 
Uh, his main contribution is his theory of the unconscious. So he believed that dreams, our dreams, are products of the unconscious mind. That there was a thing called the unconscious mind and our dreams came out of this place. And they could be analysed to provide some access to the things, the other things that were in this unconscious area, mostly our deep-seated fears and desires. And Freud's term um, when he was analysing and trying to bring out um, these deep-seated fears and desires, his term was psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis. Um, out of um, performing his psychoanalysis, he developed a theory of the structure of the mind. Um, and what he said was, the conscious mind is the stuff that we have ready access to. That's our thoughts and our perceptions. Um, you know, the, the, the person that we, we feel that we are normally. Then there's a pre-conscious uh, mind, which is our memories. These are things that we have access to, but they're not consciously in our minds. So if I said to you, um, what did you have for lunch yesterday? That wasn't in your mind um, in a sense of you thinking about it until I said that. But it's somewhere that you can actually draw, um, draw from and bring it into the conscious mind. And so Freud calls that the pre-conscious. But then there's this unconscious area, what uh, an area that today we tend to, to talk about as subconscious, but Freud called it the unconscious mind, which is an area that we don't have ready access to. We can't deliberately draw things out of this area, but they are there nevertheless. And these influence how we feel, how we behave, uh, what we believe. They influence our identity. The unconscious, he said, is buried deep within our psyche. Um, Freud also came up with um, a, a kind of a way of thinking about the um, the sort of this relationship between this unconscious us and the conscious us, and it consists of these three components: the id, the superego, and the ego. So the id is part of the unconscious mind and this is our instinctive basic drives. He said the id is dominated by what he called the pleasure principle. So a newborn child is purely id. It's a mass of instinctive needs that demand immediate satisfaction. So a child is just basically um, constantly demanding um, stuff and it doesn't have any kind of um, any barriers or thoughts about whether it should should or shouldn't demand it just does demand in the adult um, this is equivalent to the basic drives hunger sex rage um, it's illogical uh, it has no moral aspect to it and it's very primal it comes from that uh, animal instinctive kind of side to us and if we if we um, were to give it a, a sentence that sentence would be I want it and I want it right now so that's our id the superego um, is also in our um, unconscious and the superego is um, the voice of our parents is a way of thinking about it. This is a part of us that polices the impulses of the id. It's this kind of moral voice, and, and I don't mean moral in a kind of it is correct, but it, it, it feels like um, there are morals being brought into, into power. Um, so for us, it feels like a moral voice. Um, and so Freud saw this as the voice of the parents or of society within us. So not society doesn't need to be there to tell you what to do and what not to do. We, we already know that and, and we get that as we grow up. But we get it from a very, very young age. And Freud says it's no more rational than the id. Um, and if it had uh, a sentence that... Um, 
um, could sort of make sense of it, it would be you shouldn't or you mustn't. So it's always about um, trying to um, police your actions and protect you. Okay, um, and finally um, is the ego, uh, which today we all sort of know this term, it's very, very uh, popular. Um, and while today we sort of think about it as this uh, sort of something around ideas of arrogance, um, the ego for Freud was just the conscious mind, who you, who you are, um, who you perceive yourself to be, your sense of your own identity, your rational self. Um, and the, the ego uh, in Freud say, uh, works to create a balance between the unconscious desires of the id and the unconscious censorship of the superego. And it says, if we, if we were to give it a uh, if we were to give it a, a sentence, um, that sentence would be what if or should I. So it's um, the id might be saying, um, I want food, eat as much as possible. And the um, superego, the parent in us says, no, you shouldn't, do not eat any of that food. And so the ego's job is to go, well, maybe I can have a bit, you know, or maybe I deserve a treat. I'm going to eat that whole cake. Um, but it's the ego that's the one that kind of um, makes those decisions. Um, and it's kind of always in this difficult spot where it's suffering the desires of the id. And it also suffers the punishment of the superego, which after we've eaten the cake, um, then we feel terrible guilt. Well, some of us do. I don't. I like cake. Okay. Um, so that's our three um, sort of key components of the structure of the mind according to Freud. The id, which says, go ahead and do it. The superego, which says, do not do it. And the ego, which has to work out which one it's going to do or not do. So the superego, uh, if the id says, do it, and the ego says, um, should I? The superego is saying, don't you dare, young lady. Um, so if the ego decides to do it, the id is satisfied, but then the superego punishes you with anxiety and guilt. Okay. Um, now, what Freud thought was that when there's too much conflict with the superego, um, then this leads us to repress the things that are causing that conflict. Our mind represses whatever the thing is um, that's causing the conflict. It pushes that out of the conscious mind and into the unconscious. And it represses things that are too difficult for the conscious mind to deal with. So the unconscious becomes a kind of repository of the unacceptable thoughts, those thoughts or desires that we might have that are socially unacceptable, or memories that are too traumatic to remain conscious. Um, unfortunately, repressed thoughts resurface when our guard, the ego, is down. Um, so when the ego is not around watching us. Um, and so one of those sort of key um, periods when our ego is down is of course when we're asleep um, but if we are awake and things are sort of serious enough they can um, still emerge into the conscious realm but usually in a kind of um, disguised form. Freud also discovered that patients under hypnosis were um, were in that state too, where their guard was down. Um, uh, but mostly he looked at when people were asleep um, and then um, these repressed things would come through, through um, in dreams or nightmares. Um, we sometimes see them too in the form of accidents. Uh, that is slips of the tongue, Freudian slips, when you say one thing but mean your mother, uh, another. <laughs> you see what I did there? Um, as things come to the surface, the ego is protecting them, um, or is protected, it's protecting itself from them. Um, 
by having the unconscious mind distort them and making them sort of cryptic so they don't come to the surface as they actually are but in this disguised form and that's how we wind up with these um, Freudian slips um, and things like that. And here is uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, demonstrating for us the power of the Freudian slip. I learned about the president for seven and a half years I've worked alongside him and I'm proud to have been his partner and we've had trials, we've made some mistakes, we've had some sex setbacks. <laughs> Um, and in extreme cases, uh, as these things force their way to the surface um, um, in the form of sickness, they sometimes make us behave in inexplicable ways, irrational uh, but extreme emotions or fears. And Freud postulated that hysterical patients were suffering from these repressed ideas or memories forcing their way out. He moved away from hypnosis, as we said, to what he called the talking cure, where patients lie on a couch and talk about their dreams, and they're asked to randomly associate. Um, sometimes this is called free association, and we use it quite a bit when we do things like brainstorming where patients were asked to say whatever comes into their mind. In this way, the repressed thoughts, desires and memories could come out, albeit still in a cryptic form, and thus still protecting the patient from them. The task, Freud said, of the analyst is to decipher um, the cryptic messages to try to find out what was underneath them. <clears throat> so Freud also um, developed a theory around um, the development uh, of the subconscious mind. And what Freud said was that um, we all go through uh, childhood psychosexual stages. These stages he defined as oral, anal and phallic. There's actually uh, there's more stages than that, but I'm just keeping it to the kind of three key ones. Um, that sort of tend to be the most significant. Um, so Freud said um, at the oral stage, this is the first stage that the child goes through, um, the child's main stimulation is oral through the mouth and that is the mother's breast and the child is totally dependent upon the mother and so a sense of trust and comfort are developed at this stage. Uh, and the end of this stage is the weaning of the child from the breast. Problems can develop in this stage um, from uh, the mother not being able to, to wean the child properly or not being able to breastfeed or you know not, not being there for the child. All, all sorts of sorts of difficulties can come up and Freud said that when you have problems at this stage, the adult can become orally fixated and they can have difficulties in trust in relationships or over-dependency in relationships and uh, wind up with problems um, around drinking, smoking, nail-biting, all of these orally directed habits. Now, I should say here that Freud has been um, fairly solidly criticised uh, and, and these theories are you know, pretty old now um, uh, and he's certainly been criticised because of uh, a very male-centric viewpoint, and we'll you'll see more of that as we talk about the theories. Um, and and some of these criticisms are absolutely uh, spot on. But it should be remembered that prior to uh, Freud's theories, um, people were just being locked up um, for. Uh, any number of sort of ailments um, or or strange behaviour and that Freud really started to sort of put a spotlight on uh, women having um, all sorts of subconscious reasons for um, sometimes other in, in inexplicable behaviour and that that people started to think oh maybe there's there's um, other things that we need to look for here and sort of opened up a really uh, a much more humanistic sort of way of treating people um, and so even though he, he certainly can be criticized as being male centric I mean that was very much uh, part of the the era um, and the culture that he was uh, growing up in himself um, 
So the next stage uh, is the anal stage, and this is the stage where the child learns control of their own body, specifically uh, bladder and bowel control while they're toilet training. So if a parent gives positive reinforcement and the child then develops uh, into a healthy way, uh, everything's cool, but if the, if the parent is um, or punishing or ridicules the child or there are other sorts of issues, then the um, the child can develop problems in later life, according to Freud. Um, so with no encouragement, a child can become um, anally expulsive as an adult, which uh, leads to a destructive or wasteful personality. And with too much parental control, the child can become anally retentive uh, with a need for excessive control and order. And anal retentive is uh, the term that we, we most often hear um, these days, if somebody says, well, that person's really rather anal, um, meaning that they are a bit controlling or they're a bit uh, finicky um, about things. Um, that comes from Freud's theories. Uh, and if you find that you are making sure that every item on your desk is neatly laid out and beautiful and tidy and you're bedroom is spotlessly clean all the time, then that means you're perhaps a little bit anal. No biggie. Um, and the third stage that Freud uh, talked about is uh, the phallic stage. And the phallic stage, this is where the child suddenly sort of recognises that it has genital region um, and the children start to recognise the difference between males and females. Uh, a fixation at this time um, can result in later reckless behaviour and Freud said or extreme vanity and pride and it can also lead to a difficulty to let oneself experience intimacy. Freud suggested problems in this stage may be the cause of homosexuality um, which I don't think we we believe anymore and don't really care do we? Um, so that was Freud's key sort of theories about um, our early childhood um, uh, development of these kind of sections of the subconscious. Um, uh, Freud also talks about uh, in that phallic stage uh, something called the Oedipal complex which you may have heard about at this stage boys begin to see their fathers as rivals for their mother's affections and that leads to this Oedipal complex um, and it's more complex for girls, Freud said, and they develop penis envy at this stage. And that's why Freud has copped quite a bit of flack, um, uh, because there was no sort of actual proof of any of that sort of stuff. Uh, it just seemed like, um, well, you can you can read all about it at the victorianweb.org science Freud develop HTML. Um, so you might have seen these Rorschach tests. This is a very much a Freudian kind of experiment where um, this uh, obscure shape is used to tap into the unconscious. So uh, we find that um, Freud is being used here in the clinical sense to explore um, what what's going on in somebody's minds. So dreams I uh, can tell you about your unconscious fears and desires. Also fairy tales and myths um, tell uh, us about the unconscious fears and desires of a society as well as of an individual. So you might sort of consider what the subconscious meanings are of something like Jack and the Beanstalk or uh, Red Riding Hood. Um, so both dreams and fairy tales and myths um, tend to be things that we can look at from the Freudian perspective as well we can look at actually just about anything from a Freudian perspective because it's just a perspective that we bring to bear on things. Uh, also jokes, um, Freudian slips, um, the technical term is parapraxis. Um, also uh, word association, that's what we use in um, our brainstorming. Um, and we see Freud uh, being used in art therapy. And if you want to check out some of those uh, things, Red Riding Hood and Jack and the Beanstalk, there's some links there. Okay, uh, I want to um, jump forward um, to more recent times. I think it was probably the 1970s. 
um, and uh, an author by the name of Eric Byrne uh, talked about uh, he's, he's got a book called Games People Play um, and this is a form of uh, Freudian analysis called transactional analysis and what Byrne said is that each of us has inside a parent an adult and a child which is very very uh, closely linked obviously to uh, Freud's superego, ego and id um, but he was not so much interested in just what's going on inside one person but what the transaction how transactions occur between different people so if person number one says um, if you're going to student services for help with your essay could you drop that overdue library book in because student services is on the same floor as the library and the expected response from person number two might be um, yeah good idea sure and this is um, fairly standard adult to adult communication uh, the ego uh, speaks to the ego of the other person and gets ego feedback however um, if they say, I don't have time to be making drop-offs, I have other things going on in my life, you know. This is person two's parent being activated. And they've tried to engage person number one's child in the interaction. So this benefits person number two by making them feel more important and in control of the relationship. So that's the parent of person number two um, responding and trying to activate the child of person number one. Um, demanding a response from your child, um, it could be uh, when somebody says something like, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to tell you what to do. If, if, if the person number one responds back from the child, um, then it might be something like that. Um, uh, sorry, um, didn't mean it, uh, I'm just having a, a, a bad day, so it's kind of like a little kid speaking. Um, however, if the adult continues to speak to their adult, so it's a suggestion, um, but of course you've got your own priorities, no problem. Um, you're, you're asking their adult to respond, so uh, actually it is a good idea, I, I, I'll see if I've got the time to do it. Um, more often than not, that can um, um, cause more problems because if they're trying to set up a relationship between their parent and your child, um, there's some kind of something's going on there, and so it will most likely anger them if you refuse to uh, go with that uh, relationship. But it's not a good thing to to do to to do what they're asking. Um, um, and so um, they may just continue to demand a response from, from the child. Yes, I do have my own priorities and things like that. Um, sometimes the respondent changes tack and switches to engage your parent with their child. Oh, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to be snappy. I'm just having a really hard day. They're saying, don't be mean to me. I'm just like a little kid. Burns suggests that all of these responses are actually person number two attempting to have more power in the relationship through manipulation, which may work in the short term but ultimately sets up a dysfunctional relationship that's not actually good for anybody. Um, okay. Uh, another way that Freud, uh, Freud's theories have been used um, has been in advertising um, and in design, of course. Um, and Vance Packard uh, wrote a book in the 1950s called The Hidden Persuaders, which caused quite a stir. So in advertising, um, uh, we might say that um, we're, we're, we're constantly searching for what motivates a person to buy one product over another. And what Vance Packard was suggesting um, was that um, advertisers were using psychology to secretly manipulate people, um, and you can look you can look up um, the Hidden Persuaders. Uh, it's a pretty old book now, but um, uh, it uh, it certainly caused considerable panic uh, when it came out. People thought that they were being um, subconsciously um, manipulated, um, and I think one of the things that Packard really publicised was this notion of a single frame in a film being shown um, and 
that working on people in what was called subliminal advertising, uh, which is really a form of conspiracy theory. There's not a lot of evidence that subliminal advertising works. Um, it was mostly promoted by advertisers so that they could convince um, manufacturers to use their uh, advertising services because they had this technique, this subliminal advertising technique that would convince people uh, to buy whatever product they wanted to sell them. So if you're writing um, an essay, as you will be later on this year, um, about how products work, don't use the term subliminal. Um, it's really quite discredited. We can talk about subconscious, working on subconscious things, but subliminal really has this kind of conspiracy theory feel about it, as if people are totally manipulable and it's not really shown to be true. It also has a lot of connotations of popular culture rather than academic um, sort of in intellectual uh, understanding. Um, Interestingly though, advertisers um, noting how people loved uh, or got right into this idea of being manipulated um, started to actually use quite deliberately uh, Freudian symbols in their work, sometimes quite tongue-in-cheek and sometimes uh, maybe not. You can decide for yourself, um, but I'm sure as you sort of look around you can see s Freudian symbols, things that are reminiscent of um, phallic, oral or anal kind of stages um, that are used to appeal to um, possible customers. So here is our Pierre Cadam, pour monsieur, a reflection of the man um, who seems to be a penis. And here's some jockets and there is a nicely positioned little plant in the background which some might say is Freudian some ads are just Freudian right from every aspect and there's an argument that there are effects which work on us through the subconscious so it, there might actually be some subconscious um, influence on us uh, and maybe not but it doesn't matter either way the advertisers can't really lose out so we see um, is that really uh, an Eiffel Tower? Is it a bottle? Is it a penis? I don't really know. Um, but certainly interesting ads are being made to appeal to uh, the various fixation stages, oral, anal, phallic and genital. Um, so clearly some, some are very obvious in, in what that appeal is, so um, the oral sort of stage. Um, and these make use of um, symbols that Freud saw as key triggers of subconscious urges. Um, for example, Freud regarded bicycles in dreams as subconscious symbols of the sex act, and certainly in the early days of advertising we see lots of bicycles being used. It doesn't quite make sense um, today because um, in Freud's time, uh, if a woman was riding a bicycle, there was the sort of possibility of catching a glimpse of ankle, uh, whereas today uh, we don't really care that much. But it's it, it's the idea of physical exertion, um, which is still sort of symbolic uh, if, if we go to primal urges of the sex act. Um, so, um, whether conscious or unconscious, the suggestion of sexuality is often used in commercials because of its appeal to our more primal instincts. So when we see something like this, why do we have a woman standing there looking um, sexually suggestive? Um, it's because we, we can't help but make an association between the girl and the car. So you know that you don't get the girl by buying the car, but the association appeals to the unconscious. She stands in a sexual pose, the hands and the high heels positioning the legs all direct attention to the genital area and um, and we see this over and over and over in lots and lots of uh, sort of poses. It's a sexual invitation. Sometimes the sexual invitation um, is not quite so subconsciously directed, it's quite uh, overt. So 
here we're being given um, a little narrative, a little story. Um, so you buy the car and you can see the way that the story unfolds from there. Um, and you buy the drink, you're getting the woman. So the drink is the woman. But of course that's all so, sort of subconscious. We're not expected to look at it and then analyse in detail what's going on in the picture. Um, there's the Isuzu Bighorn. I don't have anything to say about that. Okay, and Purex. Um, interesting. Oh, for, hang on a second, I'm just going to stop that. Um, so. Yep, and that's the oral stage, which is, oh, we're always going to see that placing uh, an emphasis on the mouth or the breasts. Um, so in design and advertising, um, we can use symbols, um, and Freud saw these as key triggers of subconscious urges. For example, Freud regarded bicycles in dreams as subconscious symbols of the sex act, um, probably uh, much more so than uh, we do today, um, because in Freud's time uh, to see a woman riding a bicycle there was always uh, the off chance of catching a glimpse of ankle, uh, whereas today it's not such a big deal. However, we still any kind of physical activity is still a sort of symbol that uh, relates us back to um, those primal um, uh, understandings which uh, in in those sorts of cases are always the sex act. Um, whether conscious or unconscious the suggestion of sexuality is often used in commercials because of its appeal to our primal instincts, those subconscious needs and desires. So um, in advertising we make the association between the car and the girl. You know that you're not going to get the girl by buying the car, but the association appeals to the unconscious. So she stands in a sexual pose, the hands, the high heels, positioning the legs all direct attention to the genital area. And it's a fairly uh, common sort of motif in lots of advertising and design. Um, that sexual invitation. Um, works on the subconscious. Sometimes it's quite um, um, oblique and sometimes it's very direct. Um, in this one it's not even really an unconscious appeal, it's kind of, they've created an actual narrative um, so you can get your Kia and the keys are the keys to much more than just the car never realized that the Kia was quite so um, sexy, but there you go. Um, sometimes the sexual invitation is kind of uh, uh, sort of hidden in there. So in this case, we're looking at the drink. Uh, the girl is in the drink. You buy the drink. You buy the girl. Um, it's sort of uh, semi-conscious sort of thinking. Um, here is the big horn. The Isuzu Bighorn, uh, I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes if you have a look at um, toilet paper, uh, you will often see the, um, some kind of little dog or some t type of little creature. And very often it's uh, brownish and kind of pooish looking. Yes, I'm sorry. It's uh, upsetting to, s to know that all of those little dogs are just little poos that are re re um, reflecting your anal compulsive needs. Or bears. There you go. I don't know what that one's doing. Um, that's a bit freaky, to be honest. So we can see um, the Katy Perry Clippers phallic, um, and what I would like to do is point you to some other um, Freudian slips and forms of symbolism. Uh, I'll put some uh, little uh, vids here that you can have a look at and maybe in um, 
uh, in your tutorials, you can discuss what they might appeal to, what's uh, of the psychosexual uh, stages of development they may be appealing to.